Okay, so this morning we have seen how we can use um, equidistribution theorems on the space of lattices to prove something interesting um, for distribution of some number theoretic sequences. Have one dimensional sequences distributed modulo one. And so in this afternoon, I would like to talk about um, more general problems um, of distribution and randomness in, in point sets. So imagine you uh, look at the stars on a nice night in Trieste, no clouds, and you look up and you record the directions in which you see a star. So the stars are points. You record the direction in which you see a star, which means you uh, draw a point set on the unit sphere. And then you would like to understand something about the distribution of those points on the unit sphere. OK? And you can ask how random are they, et cetera, et cetera. So that's exactly the question we're going to ask, except that our stars will be sitting on particular sets, for example, on a lattice, or they could be completely random. Um, so we we'll leave this general for now and ask some more general questions. So just to make precise what I mean is here's our point set. And this is where we are at the cross. So we draw the unit sphere around this point set. And now we draw a line from the star to the observer and record the direction of each of the stars as a point on, in this case, the unit circle. And we now want to understand the distribution of these things on the unit circle. Um, and this, of course, works in, in higher dimensions. So I'm going to denote the point set by P. And by point set, I will always mean a locally finite set in RD. Um, and we are going to look at all the points that are within distance t. So obviously, you can only see the, the stars that are not too far away. So we define pt to be the intersection of our point set with a ball of radius t. And then, so this would be our ball of radius t here. And then we are interested in the statistical properties of this as t tends to infinity. Uh, examples of sets you might want to consider um, well, ZD, um, that's something, or, or other uh, Euclidean lattices, or you can look at the primitive lattice points. You can look at shifted lattices. Um, you can look at orbits of uh, hyperbolic lattices. So gamma is, as before, gamma is a subgroup in, let's say, SLDR. That's another nice set to look at. And E is just any fixed vector you start off with. Um, P could be a quasi-crystal, and that's something we're going to look at. So for instance, you could look at um, the vertex set of a Penrose tiling and ask, how are the directions of this distributed? Um, you could look at the saddle connections of translation surfaces. And in particular, this question of statistics of direction has been looked at by Atreya, Chaika, and Lelevre. Um, or it could simply be a Poinçon process. Or other random processes. So this, these are some examples. And um, a sort of very closely related question, and this was the question that um, 
uh, interested us most, but I won't actually talk so much about this, is in, if instead of looking at the directions, you look at the free path lengths in the Lorentz gas. So you could take your point set again. Here's your point set in RD. Now, around each point, you draw, you draw a little ball of radius r. And now you consider, so this is our radius r, so this will be 2r, the diameter, and now you consider a point particle moving around in this point set, and that's the famous Lorentz gas. And one question you can ask is, uh, what about the distribution of free path lengths in the Lorentz gas? This means that you start with a particle with a random position, or even a fixed position. Let's fix the position, but with a random velocity, v. And you ask, uh, if v is randomly distributed in some way with respect to some nice measure, say the uniform measure on the sphere, so you shoot with uniform probability in any direction, when will you hit the first scatterer, okay? And the analog of letting t go to infinity here is the limit when r tends to zero. And in this case, you can hope to find a limit distribution for the distribution of free path lengths. And I'll come back to that. So that's another problem that, that you can ask here. And the techniques that I'll now develop uh, in this lecture and with Andre Andreas will um, continue tomorrow, uh, will help you understand both the, the, the question of the statistics of directions in those point set as well as the distribution of free path lengths, as, as you will see. Okay. So, now, the, the key message of this lecture will be, very similar as in the two-dimensional setting this morning, is to explain how these uh, kind of the, this kind of set of problem can be reduced to a problem of studying certain spherical averages on the appropriate spaces. If our point set is a lattice, the appropriate space will be the space of lattices. If the point set is something else, it'll be something else and something more mysterious, which we don't have a theory for. We have just little examples that we study. And we were already very happy to be able to do it, for instance, for the Penrose tiling. Um, so that's what we would like to understand. This morning I showed you how to reduce the question to uh, horospherical averages. Now here, the, uh, the, the, the task is to reduce things to spherical averages. Now in order to do this, um, let me ta ta start talking about the question of um, the fine scale statistics of directions of such a point set that's projected onto the unit sphere. So again, we have points, a point set P and RD, and we project all the points that are within distance t to the observer onto the unit sphere. Yeah, that's the setting. And now we would like to understand the fine scale statistics. So let me make a three-dimensional picture. So this is the unit sphere on which we project our points. This is the big ball of radius t. Um, uh, which we consider our point sets. And now, do you remember this morning how we characterized uh, randomness in a point set on a circle? We simply said that we are going to throw uh, a very small interval uh, whose size is um, proportional to the mean spacing of our elements 
And we throw that random onto the unit uh, interval, right? And we want to understand that statistic. That's a good measure. So here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take a very small disk or other test set here um, that's whose, whose volume is proportional to one over the number of points that we have. And we're just going to place this random on the unit sphere. Okay. So we'll have a very small set here. And it will now be equivalent, rather than projecting and looking at the points here, to simply ask, what is the number of points in such a um, cone? Now, the, the way we are going to scale the cone here is in a very particular way. So I'm going to take a ball of radius t. So this is the radius t. Let me draw this in yellow. And here's our little set dt. Um, and the point sets that I will look at will have sort of, like the lattice, more or less constant density. So when I count the number of points in a big ball, that number will be proportional to the volume of the ball. So this means that my disk here should have a size that's inverse proportional to um, the, the volume of, of that ball. So omega will be the um, area element on the uh, unit sphere here. So we will now ask that our disk dt has volume um, sigma over theta d to the t. Uh, and one thing, the theta will be exactly the number of points, the asymptotic number of points. So when we count number of points in here, we would like to assume for now that it grows like um, some constant times t to the d, OK? When points grow at a different rate, then you have to do uh, different scalings as t tends to infinity. So dt will be a spherical disk on the unit sphere with this volume. So that's the right scaling to understand the fine scale statistics. And Um, let's just see how our things scale here. So when you blow this disk up to the um, to to the to this disk here that is the 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 disk on the um, sphere of radius t, then the volume will be roughly, or not roughly, it will be equal to um, sigma over theta td. I should have said here, this sigma, um, let me just remember what that is. I think that's the volume of the unit ball or unit sphere. What was that sigma? Oh no, okay, so yeah, that was that is just the um So 
maybe I do that. Ah, sorry, Andreas. Yes, 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 yes. So, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Sigma is just sigma is just a fixed constant relative to which I, I measure I measure the sphere. Okay, so um, I just say I'm gonna you're gonna give me some sigma and then I'm gonna define my my sphere in this way. So sigma is just a variable. Okay. Because that's my test set. I don't just want to have one disk. I want to have many disks, OK? So I want to have big disk and small disk. But they're all going to be very small uh, relative to the sphere. So a sigma is just a parameter. Yeah, you're right. OK. OK, and now we want to understand the, the, the fine scale statistics. So what are we going to do? is we, as just this morning, except that we're now working on a sphere, is we are going to look at the points in our point set, PT, restricted to the ball of radius T, um, that fall into this disk. OK. And I'm in introducing also the notation V here because the disk has center V, okay? So this direction here in which we go is V. And what we like to do, like in this morning, we were throwing the center of the interval at random. We will now throw the direction V at random. So that's now our random variable. So we're asking, what's the probability of finding K points in a randomly placed disk of radius, well, of this volume, sigma over theta t to the d. And um, this is the same as the number of elements in our set P intersected with this particular cone here. So this blue thing is the cone that we have here. So this is C, T, V. And how does this cone look like? Well, this cone, as you can see, is very long because T tends to infinity. It's a very long cone. And up here, it's very small. So the disks that describes the cap, the spherical disk that describes the cap of the cone, uh, is roughly, has roughly volume 1 over t. So it has radius here. This radius is roughly what? t to the um, minus 1 over d minus 1. That's the radius of this disk, right? It's a d minus 1 dimensional disk. It has volume 1 over t. So its radius is up to constants, 1 over t to the d minus 1. So that's how it looks like. And now we're going to do a very similar trick um, as before. OK, let me just formally write down what we're interested in. And that's exactly the distribution of this number when v is chosen randomly. So let lambda be a probability measure, a Borel probability measure on SD minus 1 on the unit sphere. So that's the sphere of directions. 
This means it's absolutely continuous with respect to the volume element on the sphere. Um, and we are interested now in the number of points in this little disk. So this is simply that. Okay, so this represents the probability that they are, oh sorry, that's equal to, to R, that there are exactly R projected points of our point set P in a small disk in a certain direction. Yeah, so this depends on sigma, which we will keep fixed forever, but we can vary it. We can always decide which sigma to choose, right? And so if you remember, this morning I talked about what happens if you have a very random set. So for instance, if P would be coming from a Poisson point process, then again, as T tends to infinity, this would converge to a Poisson distribution. And now the question is, well, what will this converge to when we have a lattice, when we have a quasi-crystal, or when we have other interesting point sets, okay? That is the question. Is that clear? Yeah? Yeah, this means uh, lambda is absolutely continuous with respect to the volume element on the sphere. Right, so that's the problem, and now again, I'll show you how to translate this problem into a problem of spherical averages. And the key observation is that we can again act on RD with SLDR and convert this very long and thin cylinder into a nice object. The price we pay is that then we will act with SL2, SLDR on this point set P. So if P is a lattice, we'll act in the space of lattices, and if P is not a lattice, then it's not so clear what's happening. Okay, so, um, let us define a map K from the sphere to SOD that takes the vector V to a rotation in such a way that VKV gives you the uh, standard unit vector and, uh, for the first coordinate. So that's just, uh, um, that's just that. And you can always find a smooth map that does it for you, that's smooth except maybe at, at one point. And secondly, let me define a diagonal matrix that has in the first upper corner a t to the minus 1, and then down here a d minus 1 block where we have um, this. So you see this matrix also has determinant 1, so it's an SLDR. Okay, because here we have d minus 1 guys of this, so when you take the determinant, you get exactly 1. So why did I introduce those guys? Well, the key fact is, which you can check, that when you apply this, these two transformations to our long and stretched cylinder, then this long stretch cylinder becomes, and I'm saying cylinder, I should say cone, then this cone becomes um, much better proportioned. So then, so here is the guy 
that you see on the picture. So what am I going to do first? Well, I apply this matrix, and you see then what you get is a cylinder. So I'm just rotating it so it points in the first coordinate direction. And then if I apply dt, so the cylinder now looks like this. Now if I apply dt, what will happen is that the long direction will be pushed together and the direction orthogonal to it will be expanded. <clears throat> and when t is very large, you see that this will converge to a nicely proportioned cone that looks like this. Everybody believes that? Yeah, do you all see this? What happens to this, to this cylinder as you stretch it down? This thing has a little spherical cap. But remember, when this is very, very big, this is a very small spherical cap, the radius of the spherical cap um, is of the order of 1 over t to the minus t minus 1. So it's very flat. So if you push that together with this linear transformation, you'll get a cylinder there that has now a flat cap. And that's exactly this object here. OK? So what have we achieved is that this number that we are interested in Ah, x1. Yes, 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 yes. Correct, yes. So, so roughly, and this is um, heuristic now, roughly the number of points in the, the cone that I was interested in is now given by the number of points in this cone, but for a set that has now been rotated and stretched. No, let me write this uh, underneath. Rotated and stretched, and now intersected with the fixed cone. Now, the reason why I only write approximately, the only reason is because I have, um, because this is a, is a convergence. So this is only roughly this set, right? So when you look at the difference between those two sets, that will be a very small area. And whether or not there is a point or not will give you the error in this term. What we will see later on is that the probability that there is a point in a very small set is very small. So in a distributional sense, you can make this rigorous, OK? So if you're unlucky, these numbers could be completely different. Because remember, the way we've scaled this set we have a very small set, so we expect only finitely many points to, to be in this set, right? It's a random set. This cylinder, if you like, has a fixed volume as t tends to infinity. So when I write this is approximately that, it doesn't make much sense because we expect this to be a finite number and we expect this to be a finite number, let's say one or two, right? But it will make sense later on in a probabilistic sense, so that the probability by, 
uh, that these two numbers actually will differ will be very small. Yeah? But I'm just trying to give you a sort of uh, a general feeling for what we're doing here. OK. So this is the thing that we're interested in. And now we are interested in the distribution of this random variable. That's a random variable because v is random. And you can think now of what you have here, in fact, as a random point process. What is a random point process? So, what we need to do, we need to study the random point set, and let me give that a name, xi t, which is simply our original point set p rotated and then dilate it. And what we like to, to prove is that this random point set converges in distribution as t tends to infinity to a limiting random point process. And let me explain to you why that is, why this problem is a special case of this formulation. So. <clears throat> So the question what we have here is, does such a limiting process exist? What are its, its properties, et cetera? So just to recall, recall, so a random point process you can think of as a random measure in RD. And this random measure has a very particular form. It basically assigns to each point in your set a delta mass at this point. And that way, you can think of it as a random measure. And how can you test this random measure? Well, you take a test set, and you simply ask, how many points of my random point process fall into this test set? OK, so what's the probability that for any given nice set, you find k points of your random point process in there? And you cannot just only take one set, but you can take several sets. Um, <clears throat> and if you understand it for k test sets, then you say you understand the distribution of your random point process, in, in, in the, you understand the k-dimensional distribution of your random point process. Okay, so a random point process is a random variable taking values in the space of locally finite subsets uh, of Rd. And its k-dimensional distribution is given by asking for the probability that the number of points of your process, uh, the number of points in test set A1 is equal to R1, and so on. Number of points in the test set AK is equal to RK. 
And we're only interested in finite dimensional distribution here. In fact, we're only interested in the one dimensional distribution of this point set, okay? So my message here is, if you take your test set A1 to be this cone, then you answer the question that we got here. If you're interested in the free path lengths of the Lorentz gas, then it turns out the test set is not a cone, but a cylinder. Nothing else changes. So you see that thinking of this as a point process is quite useful because the notion of the point process doesn't really uh, uh, depend on the, on the notion of the test set, right? It's independent of the test set. Of course, it depends on the spaces of test set that you, that you uh, want to consider. But in this way, you combine both the distribution of statistics of directions and the distribution of free path lengths into the same framework. And what we really want to prove now is under which circumstances we can understand that this randomly rotated point set converges to a limiting process. And if we understand the limiting process, then we understand the answer to the two questions of directions and the Lorentz gas. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's go to the first example where we can answer these questions. And that is, again, our space of lattices. So, P, let's assume, is now a fixed Euclidean lattice. and see what we can say here. And you will see the parallels appearing of this, morning, uh, this morning's lecture. And the kind of thing that Andreas and I are now studying is in which cases can what we are doing in the space of lattices, in which, for which classes of point sets P can we extend these considerations, yes? Hmm? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so here, these AIs will be from a certain class of test sets, and in particular, in what we will consider, these will be uh, bounded sets, um, with boundary of measure zero. And then uh, that's the kind of sets we are interested in. And you can take, so, AI to be this cone, and then you go exactly to this. So cones are allowed test sets, in other words. But it always depends on what kind of process you, you look at, um, of course. So, so in other words, let's say P to be Z to the D or general Z to the D M for some. M in S L D R uh, or no, no, right? We can do A S L D R. Let me write little G, little G in A S L D R. So we can also shift our lattice, and that's quite interesting because that means you observe your, your lattice from a point that's that sort of shifted. You're not sitting on a lattice point as you look out, but you're shifted against it. Was there a question? Yeah? Uh, so uh, your point, uh, reference point is origin, right? The reference point is the origin. And, uh, but then I don't see how you are giving out multiples, I mean, two points in the same direction. That can happen, yes. So one of them it is not counted. And 
So that's a very good question. That's an excellent question. So I have two options here. If I have two points that lie exactly on the same line, uh, I have two, two possibilities. I only counted once or I counted twice. And we can do both things. And it's a very interesting question. So you either think of the set that is the projected set as a multi-set, okay? Then you count them with multiplicity, or you don't, and then you just count each point once. What is not equal? This to that? No, no, it is, yeah, okay. So think of this as a multi set. Okay, Andrea said swap it around, okay. Yeah? Ah, PT. No, 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 PT, PT, PT. PT. Okay, everybody happy? Yeah. You're happy now, right? Yeah, very good, okay. Right, so, so if this is the case, um, then we've already seen uh, what to do this morning. So we now um, are faced with this problem of looking at um, the Lebesgue measure of V in SD minus 1 so that ZDM, so I'm taking this, oh no, G. And then I'm acting with rotations, KV. And okay, so I should now embed my rotations into, um, how did we, uh, how did you define this, Andreas? Did we define that? Okay, let me not act like this. So this is a point in RD, so I can just rotate it for now, and then I can apply this matrix. TD. So I'm looking at the set intersected with a test set AJ. And let me just do it for one test set A for now to keep notation simple. And we're asking that the number of points in here is equal to K. So you can do the same thing that I'm going to explain to you now also for several test sets that's over there, but it will just complicate the notation. So this is the measure of directions that go into this. And now, just this, as this morning, we are in, going to interpret this as a integral over S1 d minus 1 of a certain function So f is now a function on g mod gamma, and I think you call it g prime mod gamma prime, which is ASL dr, and gamma prime is ASL dz. And we rotate it, and we And what we are interested in is exactly this integral. Now, what we discussed so far is what happens if this is a horocycle. Now we have a spherical average. And what one can show is that also these spherical average and not just horospherical averages will become equidistributed. Hmm? I'm going to define f, yeah. Um, but I just wanted to motivate it first. So the question is now, using our theory on homogeneous spaces, can we understand that as t tends to infinity, this will converge to a certain integral um, of f, 
with some probability measure, we don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be Haar measure? Is it going to be some other measure? We don't know, right? But that's what we want to understand. And as Andreas is already anxious to know, is what is this function f in this particular situation? And again, just as in this morning in the one-dimensional situation, it will be some characteristic function. So what is going to be? f of g is going to be 1 if um, OK, let me write g tilde so you don't confuse it with this g. If the number of points in zdg intersect tilde, intersect with our test set A, is equal to, uh, sorry, why did I now call this k? I think I always called it r over there, right? Yeah, r. If it's equal to r, and 0 if not. So that's exactly like this morning, right? So now the idea is, again, you can show that this is a function on g mod gamma. Because if you replace g tilde by gamma g tilde with gamma in gamma, little gamma in capital gamma, this will be invariant, so it is a function. But as this morning, this is not a continuous function. And normally, when you talk about equidistribution, you want to show first that this holds for all bounded continuous functions. And now we have a problem. And this morning, I didn't tell you how you overcome this problem. Maybe I did in words. So the key point now is to understand uh, how one can do this. And um, So the key point is this is a characteristic function. Now, if you can show that the characteristic function is the characteristic function of a set whose boundary has measure 0, then with respect to the limiting measure nu that you have here, then you can um, approximate that char characteristic function from above and below by continuous function, continuous functions to arbitrary precision. And then you look at the limb sup of your continuous approximating function and your limb inf, which sandwich the two. And so the error that you make can be arbitrarily small, and that's why also the limit for your characteristic function has to exist. So what I would like to explain is how one can achieve that. OK, but before I, I do this, um, um, let me state, OK, let me. So what I, OK. So the question that we have is that when we look at the number of points. So in order to prove that, um, the, 
the boundary of this set here that we've defined here, that's a subset of G mod gamma. To prove that this hat has boundary of measure zero, what we need to establish is that the probability that there is a point in a small set uh, is small and goes to zero as the measure of this set tends to zero. So um, let me just see what the best way of, of saying this is, just a second. So let me just write this down a little bit better. So we have this limiting measure nu, and what we would like to understand is that the measure of points, GD, um, in A, is greater or equal to R as boundary of measure zero if A has boundary of measure zero and the latter is with respect to Lebesgue measure. Hmm? Ah, yeah, 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 sorry. Exactly. So, has boundary of mu measure zero, okay? Now, if I can prove that, then I can also apply this theorem. So, in fact, the trick is, if you want to do approximation from above and below, is to, in fact, look at the probability that this set has R or more points in it. And then, of course, taking by difference, you also can take the set that there are points in it. This gives you a better monotonicity because if you increase your test set R, then the set that you have here also increases or decreases. I always remember which, I forget which way around it is, okay? Well, if you insist that it's equal to R, then this doesn't hold. So this is what we would like to show. We would like to sh show that this has boundary measure, uh, 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 zero, uh, measure zero boundary. Uh, if A has Lebesgue, uh, boundary of Lebesgue measure zero. Now, and how are we going to do this? And um, I was a little bit silly here that I allowed ASL2R, so I would like to go back to SL2R to just make things more concrete. So if we are just in SL2R, then this theorem, then this convergence in fact holds for all bounded continuous functions um, with respect to Haar measure as the limit measure. So let's look at this case. So we are now in the space of lattices as before. Okay? So then this convergence for any bounded continuous function is in fact a well-known theorem that follows from the mixing property of the diagonal flow. And so now in this case, we need to show that this has Haar measure zero. And let me show you how this can be done.
So the measure of the boundary of this set can be estimated by the measure mu of um, an arbitrary, uh, a small set that sort of contains the boundary where the number of points between the interior and the exterior of this set differ. So what you need to estimate is precisely, let's call this set B, um, where there is more or one point in this set B that describes the difference, okay? And what you would like to show is that if the measure of B is small, this set will approximate our set, um, the boundary of the set A from, uh, from the outside and the inside, then, or just from above, sorry, just from the outside, then we are done. So how do we do this? So we can write this as the integral of the characteristic function of this set. Oh, sorry, there is the G tilde here. Intersect with B. You want this to be greater or equal to 1, and we integrate that over D mu G tilde. And now you apply Chebyshev's inequality, which simply says that this is the bounded above by the number of points in B. And the great thing that happens now is that you have an exact formula for this quantity here, and that's given by Siegel's formula. Which tells you that this is nothing but the volume, the Lebesgue volume of the set B. Okay, so what you see then is that the measure of this set is bounded above by the volume of B, and that's exactly what you wanted. So if B is small, that measure becomes small. And that will show that if your set A has Lebesgue measure zero, then also the boundary of the set that we considered here will have mu measure zero. So let me write down Siegel's formula, and then Andreas will talk about generalization of this tomorrow. So Siegel's original formula is exactly a statement about the measure mu on the space of lattices. And it says the following. So for any function, that's L1 on RD, um, we have the following identity that the integral over Haar measure of this so-called Siegel transform, which is defined simply as the sum over all uh, m in z d g, not counting the origin. Okay, so you take your function f, 
you form this sum. This is called the Siegel transform. Of course, point-wise, this is only nicely defined if F, say, is continuous and has compact support. But you can then extend this by the usual density argument to L1, and you get this formula. And this is the Siegel volume formula, which relates averages over the space of lattices to Lebesgue averages. What is equal to one? Yes. If d is equal to one, no, no, no. So if d is, let me just because I'm already running out of time. I'll answer in a second. Um, so the absolutely amazing thing that will Andreas will talk about tomorrow is that Veach extended this formula from lattices to very general point sets, namely to point processes or even random measures that are SLD R invariant and satisfy certain regularity conditions. So Siegel proved this really by using number theoretic techniques, and Veach realized that it's a very general probabilistic statement. And we have then used this kind of Siegel-Veach formula as a technical tool to also understand other point sets, which will be uh, in the remaining of this lecture. So I'm sorry it was a little slow and technical, but this is really a very beautiful and important formula. And um, I think the siegel veach uh, formula that Andreas will discuss today is really a beautiful, powerful um, tool that you should all sort of be aware of. Okay, thank you.